Um, you've got some special folks coming up here, incredibly knowledgeable um, about their things. Randy and, and uh, Dan. And we were going to have um, another fellow, uh, Joe Calloway. And I'll let, talk, let Scott talk about him, but there'll be a vacant seat here. Um, and Joe called me earlier this afternoon. He works with Asset Preservation, Inc. Uh, his dad fell and is on, was on the way to the hospital this afternoon, so Joe apologizes but could not be here. So, Scott, if you want this seat or... Hello, everybody. I'm Scott Trevi. I've been with these uh, uh, meetings and town hall events with Jim and the group for as long as we've been doing them. Um, and it's a good opportunity to share some of what we're learning and um, keep an update on the market. One of the most important things um, upon your entry into commercial or even residential real estate investment is surrounding yourself with the right people. It doesn't cost any more to work with the best. So. There's no real objection. So what we've done is we've assembled the best uh, tonight, as we do at every one of these town hall meetings. Um, and tonight, uh, on top of the crew that we had a minute ago with the management folks and the experienced brokers, tonight we've got some folks who are, help you after you've already successfully acquired an asset. And it's appreciated. And it's time to trade up or move on and sell. And we all get to that same crossroads. I say we because I am an investor too. Uh, I joined Jim Caston and the Caston Long Group 17 years ago uh, by way of buying an apartment building. And so I can tell you, we all get to that crossroads in investing when it's time to sell. Um, it's really loud. Um, and so what do you do? Well, it seems like the crossroads give us two choices. Either you sell and pay capital gains tax, um, or there's the 1031 exchange. And the 1031 exchange has been around since, well, a long time. Uh, Joe Calloway was scheduled to attend our uh, conference tonight, but he, there was an accident in the family he's unable to attend. Uh, but I'm gonna just, I'm gonna run through some of uh, the credentials of our guests tonight and with a slight introduction, but I'll start with Joe Calloway, who was unable to make it. He's with Asset Preservation Incorporated, a 1031 exchange accommodator that was, uh, has been in the game since the 80s. Um, really good resource. Uh, again, some of the best folks to work with. A, a lot of folks are reluctant to do a 1031 exchange for the obvious reasons. The 45-day uh, identification window, uh, the 180-day close deadline, and a variety of other limitations but it does allow you to transfer your equity tax deferred into the next asset. This tool has allowed a, a, a thousands, tens of thousands of investors to grow their equity over the years. And of course, death and taxes will catch up with you one day, but it's a great way to use the leverage that would otherwise have been paid in taxes. Um, asset preservation that Joe Calloway works with is, has a 1-800 number, 1-800-282-1031. They've got a, a lawyer that's been there for 34 years. The legal advice is free. It's like being able to call up someone who knows all the answers and getting them for free. So I'd highly recommend that you do that, 1-800-282-1031. Um, and again, Joe's not here tonight, but we can talk about 1031 exchanges, and I've performed about a dozen myself and helped clients through many, many, many exchanges. So we have some input. If you've got some questions, I'm happy to help. Um, but other than 1031 exchange, uh, or paying <laughs> taxes, capital gains taxes, and depreciation recapture, and state taxes, there's some other options. Um, and I would like to introduce one of the other, um, one of our other guests tonight who can help with um, some of your alternatives. Dan Mercer is here. He runs a company called Colorado Financial Services. Dan's been in the business a long time. Not only is he a Stanford grad, but he's a U of A alumni. Um, DST products and programs. Delaware Statutory Trusts, and I'll let Dan elaborate on that. He also has done some Reg D private placements. So this is a guy who 
has worked a variety of uh, segments in the market. He's seen a lot of different investors, large and small. He's gonna present some opportunities for those people who get into a 1031 exchange and either they can't find something in the 45 days, whatever they do find is overpriced or unacceptable, for any number of reasons, they're unable to successfully pick a replacement property. So he's gonna create some alternative in investment strategies for commercial real estate investors. 1031 exchange replacement assets is his strength. So I'd like to take this opportunity to hand it over to Dan to address some of these options that exchange investors might be able to take advantage of, Dan. Thank you. Yes, I've been in the Phoenix market, believe it or not, going on 46, 46 49 years now. Linda and I worked at uh, the Arizona Bank in the early 80s, so it's good to see her uh, still on this side of the grass with me, so I like that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, why did I get into a tax-efficient solution for people that own real estate? Um, basically because there's a tremendous amount of equity locked up in the baby boomers' assets, in family trusts, in real estate that y'all own. And when you get into a late cycle investing period, you're a little reluctant to sell because you're saying to yourself, where do I go with my money? I know what I have. I've owned it for a long time. I'm pretty comfortable with this. I know it's the top of the market. I'd love to be able to get out of this thing. This is a solution that allows an owner to list the property, get the premium price, and roll 100% of the proceeds, depreciation recapture, debt, and uh, capital gains into a replacement asset that allows you to then sit on the sidelines for as long as you want. Um, it's a great estate planning tool as well because while you own this fractional interest in this other asset, it's all passive. So you get what we call mailbox money. You don't have to worry about the tenants, the toilets, anything like that anymore. And it's managed by an investor that typically purchases a 70, 80, 90 million to $100 million group of projects. So these are institutional owners that you get the benefit of by taking your fractional ownership interest and investing with them. It's called a Delaware Statutory Trust, DST. It's part of an IRS tax code 2004-86. So it's been around since 2004. But believe it or not, there's a lot of people out here in this part of the uh, the United States that aren't aware of it. I mean, I've been in front of all the major attorneys here in town, Snell and Wilmer, uh, Tiffany and Bosco, all of them. And when I start talking about the DST, they say, you know, I've heard about that, but I've never used it. And what it provides is a tool not only for an owner, but it's a tool for a broker. Because what it does is it allows a broker to go to somebody that they know is trapped in this property, show them an exit strategy that allows them to sell the property at a premium and then roll into any alternative number of DSTs. One of the real nice things about a DST is the minimum is $100,000. So if you sell a property and you've got $500,000 left over, do you want to pay $150,000 to the government, you know, 30% tax? You can take $500,000 invested in a DST plus the two or three million that you've sold from the balance of the property and go out and find another property. It allows you to completely eliminate any tax liability that you have. So it's good for brokerage, it's good for the owners, and, and the type of assets that you can invest in are national in scope. So if you think the Phoenix market's hot, too hot, I don't wanna buy here, I don't wanna buy in a four cap. You can buy through the DST structure assets in any major market in the United States. You can even get out of that lane and get into uh, self-storage, healthcare, uh, net lease retail. Uh, so there's a number of different asset classes that you can invest in to take your money off the table, invest it in a very institutional quality asset, and then wait for the manager of that asset to make the decisions on when they're gonna exit. Um, there's typically, you can have up to 1,500 people in these DSTs. Can you can imagine if it's an 80 or $90 million asset, average investment is maybe a million dollars, uh, you, you, get, you can get a lot of people in these. So one of the stipulations that the IRS imposed on this tax code is that the sponsor has to make all the major decisions. The second thing is the sponsor takes the debt out. They sign carve-out guarantees. 
They take care of fraud, misrepresentation, waste. They take care of all of that. You as an investor have no liability on the debt. And you can roll whatever your allocation is into that property. So it gives you asset and geographical, geographical diversification. Solves the debt problem. I had a doctor who sold his practice and his office building. He had a $5 million sale on his office building, sold his practice for a million dollars. He said, God, I wish I had more real estate. I said, well, yeah, but, but you know, you, you did well, right? Of that five million, two was debt and three was equity. So we, we had a $5 million transaction and I had to solve for the debt and the equity. I put him in five different Delaware statutory trusts. He went from one asset with a recourse loan with a bank to an interest in 27 assets in m multiple states around the United States. I solved for the debt because I put him in some unleveraged DSTs and some leveraged DSTs. So I was able to balance the debt to the CPA satisfaction. So, so Dan, aside from the, the clear advantages that, that you're showing here of the seamless transition of equity and debt, mm -hmm. in as short a time as possible given the, the time constraints, give us an idea of maybe what one DST might, uh, the assets that it might hold, and what maybe a DST investor might expect as far as return in years one, two, and three. Right. These are existing assets that are, that are purchased by the sponsor. So they're typically stabilized assets. So you're not gonna go into an asset that's starting to ramp up or stabilize. So you know exactly what your returns are gonna be. And keep in mind that you're gonna be leaving an asset that perhaps is a lagging asset with respect to the income or it's an older asset that hasn't achieved its high level of income that you'd like to achieve, and you're investing in an institutional quality, class A apartment, healthcare, uh, whatever, whatever the asset class you're gonna be investing in, you're gonna be at a, at a par level significantly higher than probably what you're selling, or you wouldn't be a seller, right? So the, the, the returns on leveraged are gonna be in the five and a quarter to five and a half percent net income. Now keep in mind, that's net income after all debt service, expenses, taxes, insurance, property management, everything. That's net to the trust because the sponsor manages the real estate on a long-term master operating lease. Do they send checks every quarter or something, Dan? How does that work? Monthly. Is that reinfunded or? or Monthly, you get a check every month. Boom, mailbox money. I had a meeting yesterday with a lady, she's selling some dairy property on the west side of town. And when I explained what she could do with this DST, She's got a number of children. Each child is gonna get a DST allocated to them inside the family trust. So when she goes away, no haggling, everybody gets their DST and they deal with the step up basis in the DST so the tax liability goes away when she dies. You flop till you drop, if you will. Clearly, Dan is the top of the field on this. I would encourage everybody to get his contact information and certainly consider this um, opportunity um, when doing a 1031 exchange. I mean, I, every day I talk to investors and the and owners that are ready to sell, uh, but uh, are They're staring down the barrel of this, <laughs> the capital gains tax. And 1031 exchanges, uh, although a viable tool, can be pretty scary if you um, think about it. You got a 45 day window to identify. So talk to Dan, you know, he's yeah. got some options. We're gonna open it up let, to let me, let me mention one other thing if I could. I helped somebody in the 44th day of a 1031 exchange. I was referred to them by one of the accommodators because the client said, can you get anybody to help me because I don't want to pay this tax. I was able to identify the asset that they liked. It was a healthcare product, Ironwood Cancer Centers here in Phoenix. Inland bought seven, unleveraged. He was able to identify that the next day, solve the 45 day, and we closed in 10 days. Wow. And he was getting a check the next month. Didn't get in his car, didn't have to look at an asset. I sat down with him, showed him all the properties, went over all the rent rolls, went over the master operating lease, did the whole thing. The other important thing I'm doing right now is I'm bifurcating opportunity zone investments with DSTs so you get a full allocation of debt, equity, and ozone. So there's some really exciting things that we can do with these uh, alternative assets. Excellent, and I thank you for that comment because that segues into our next guest here. And we'll have some time for questions following, but I would like to introduce Randy Stoltz uh, to my right here. Randy runs a company called Clear Direction Investments, and uh, he's no newcomer to the field either. He has been a member of FINRA um, SIPC, 
he offers services through, in the past, uh, Concord Asset Management. But here today, he's here to share some information about Opportunity Zones. There's someone that's done his homework on Opportunity Zones. So Randy, if you would, uh, tell us about it. Okay, well good evening. I'm a native of the south side of Scottsdale. As I was chatting with my new friend, Helena, back there, we met at a recent town hall. But all that to say is I'm a homegrown native Scottsdale boy, and it's uh, been a real joy to be able to see this little city of Scottsdale, Phoenix, everything else grow up like crazy. I just, every time I drive around, it's amazing. All that said is when I started my financial practice and it morphed into what I call it today, Clear Direction Investments, who'd have thunk that downtown Phoenix, Old Town Scottsdale, among other areas, would be deemed opportunity zones. So what does that simply mean? A couple years ago, uh, the president administration creates this Tax Cut Jobs Act thingamajiggy, and that uh, every governor is empowered to nominate various census tracts, of which most will never get built on. And so right now it's a bit of a rat race to say, okay, well, let, let's, let's look at building, developing businesses, real estate projects ad nauseum in the best opportunity zones in the state of Arizona, Massachusetts, and everywhere in between. So what's happening right now is, let's just take an example. I, I like, I'll just go through a couple of clients that I'm working with and have worked with. I think that'll set the stage for what makes an opportunity zone unique. Everything Dan said here is absolutely spot on regarding the 1031 DST space. An opportunity zone, uh, there's a, an area downtown Phoenix where you probably know where the APS building is, the Arizona Center, that, that whole area is about a square mile of op zone space. And between the parking garage and the APS tower, Arizona Center is a little squeak of land, about an acre and a half, where an AC by Marriott hotel is gonna get developed. Now that, that so they'll scrape, they'll start construction on that, a firm out of Las Vegas called Lepore is gonna be the, con the construction manager on that. They built the Marriott on 28th and Camelback, so a good operator. The developer is a, is a firm that I raise money for all the time called Peachtree, they're out of Atlanta. And Peachtree, ironically, out of the 10 projects they were slated to put into opportunity zones is building this AC by Marriott and, and other hotel-oriented properties. Now, the firm that uh, was mentioned, you know, Concord, we have access to a lot of different types of funds. So you, as an individual investor, can build a business or construct your own real estate venture and self-certify in, in any opportunity zone yourself. You don't have to invest into an op zone fund, but it you know, has its advantages, no doubt about it. So I don't want to sound like a commercial about saying, hey, the AC by Marriott and Peachtree is the best place on the planet. I could make that argument and there's some other op zone funds that I could represent to you, but let's talk about the benefits and then I'll give the microphone back to Jim. What an op zone fund investment does is the following. One of my clients in the stock and bond world called me up and he said, hey, Randy, I just sold some of my XYZ stock and I've got an extra $100,000 of cap gains. I, I've heard about these op zones, what can I do with it? So he is a patient investor, so we took his $100,000, he wrote a check to this peach tree fund because he loved the hotel space. It's very profitable, long-term, it's a long-term play. It's not, gonna, it's not designed to give you a return, it's not gonna give you any yield in the, in the first three or four years, that's for sure, but what was the benefits to him and what's the benefits to others? From a tax perspective, he's able to defer all the capital gains on that $100,000 for seven years. Now, if he, become, if, he, if he was an investor next year, it's six years. So 2026, that's when you get to defer the cap gains now and pay the taxes in, say, six or seven years. That's cool. So number one, defer. Number two, decrease your capital gains tax by as much as 15%. So that's a nice benefit as Chris is working away, making the noise go away. <laughs> Thank God for Chris here. You know. <laughs> Bueller, Ooh, baby, hot. Yeah, thanks, Linda. <laughs> Defer, reduce taxes, and the real kicker, the home run, the grand slam is never pay capital gains tax on the investment you put the money in. Well, that sounds great, never. What's the caveat? You gotta hold it for 10 years. 
So if you are developing your own building or you're buying your own business or starting your own business in an op zone, and there's a couple thousand of them in the United States, but here in Arizona, let's say 30 plus op zones, half of which will never be developed on candidly, but you'll never pay taxes as long as you make money. The caveat is you wanna make sure that if you want to be an, a, an opportunity zone investor, you gotta pick a partner or a fund that's gonna be profitable. Forget the tax upsides, I mean, that's sexy stuff. But you gotta make sure that you're banking with someone that's gonna make money regardless of the upside in taxes. But it is really cool, so this $100,000 investor, I'm very confident that instead of making 13% a year internal rate of return, he and his wife will make 16% a year because of the opportunity zone thing. I'm working with a, a client of mine uh, up in Utah, just sold a, uh, a business up there for $8 million, $7, 7 million of which is all taxable gains, unless he does something with it. Now he has 180 days with which to deploy some of it, but whether you have an extra $100,000 coming out of commercial real estate, a profitable business, or appreciated stock, the typical three, then you don't have to identify a property like you do in a DST, but you're not gonna get mailbox money right out of the gate either. But if you, you have 180 days, roughly, to be able to deploy that capital gains, and it could be capital gains tax-free which means a lot if your investment, whether you do it yourself and self-certify, or you find a good op zone fund investor, I can pat myself on the back and say, hey, I'm a great broker, but that's you know, self-serving. But putting all that aside, that's the upside. The home run, never pay taxes. Caveat, the catch, you gotta keep it in there for at least 10 years, but up front, it's very appealing from a tax deferral standpoint. 2026 seems like a long ways away from now, and it is, and getting a 15% deduction or reduction rather on that existing capital gain tax is always a benefit. So I hope that helps at least put a little bit of frosting on the cake for why an Opportunity Zone fund is some, something worthwhile for those who have a lot of lazy capital gains taxes inside of their existing investment. Whether, whether again it's stock like Google, Apple, whatever, or whether it's a commercial real estate project and you don't need income and you want to never pay tax on that sucker, reduce it, all that kind of fun stuff. Or you, or you happen to know somebody that has a business and they're thinking on selling it within the next few years, maybe now is the time to do it sooner versus later. So a couple of questions, Randy, and then I'd like to open it up uh, for questions uh, from the audience. Um, do investors who invest in opportunity zones or were you to assist them in placing some funds into an opportunity zone, do they need to be accredited investors? Yes. Are there any limitations or requirements? Yes, sir. An accredited investor is someone that has at least a million dollars of investable assets, not including their residents. So you, know, you could be an investor that has two apartment complexes worth 500 grand a piece and have nothing in the bank and live in a home, you're an accredited investor. I mean, for a simple definition. But yes, you need to have at least a million dollars of, a, of a investable okay. assets. And I'm asking a question as if I were getting ready to invest in, in an opportunity zone. Would there be some special requirements for tax returns were I to invest in an opportunity zone? Is there any brain damage with my accountant or tax man? Good question. A lot of CPAs aren't really familiar with opportunity zones, and so they're learning. I mean, I, I educate those as, as I have opportunities to do that with, but it's not rocket science. I mean, there are a couple of tax forms that have to, a couple of tax form schedules that go along with what you're filing already to cert, to certify your op, your your op zone fund. But any good op zone fund investment company or sponsor is going to help you get those filled out by making sure that you don't forget about them. So if an investor approaches you and says, Randy, I heard about the Opportunity Zone you're involved in, um, do, you, do you provide like an offering memorandum or some sort of, uh, how does one find out more about this? Uh, it, it, it specifically, like your Peachtree Marriott thing, for example, rather than the confidence that you inspire, but if they got something where they can do some of their own homework or without a doubt, is, is this too new of, of an opportunity yet? It's it's not too new. There there is an investment group here in Scottsdale that that has a you know I I'm not a partner with them that has uh, created an op zone fund. Jim knows about them, but uh, in addition to Peachtree, 
as far as I know, they're the only one in town that has an Opportunity Zone fund with the AC by Marriott downtown. We also have access to a company called Griffin Capital that we're just launching right now, which is a multifamily apartment complex uh, op zone fund. And all these are national in scope. I hope that answers your question. But yes, if an individual or you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones or an entity were, had an interest in an op zone fund investment for all of the upside tax reasons, as long as the investment seems to pencil, then yes, there's always a, a PPM that's about yay thick and uh, all, all the subscription documents. But you know, we just go through a simple accreditation process to make sure that they can uh, weather the long period of time because this is not for the faint of heart. And, and, and having a good fund sponsor operator is absolutely essential. Uh, again, you have to peel back how great it is to defer taxes and be tax free on the back end because hitting a single or double isn't going to mean a whole lot of excitement on the back end if that's all it does is make five or ten percent. Right, right. Thank you, Randy. I, another quick question for Dan. Um, when it comes to um, these Delaware statutory trusts, Dan, if an investor rolls a 1031 exchange proceeds, um, into a Delaware statutory trust with your guidance and is involved in this, they're gonna get um, a monthly disbursements after a period of time or maybe soon. Uh, and again, you mentioned that the manager of the fund will decide in his experience and wisdom when to sell or dispose or whatever. But from a tax standpoint, does the investor get a K-1 every year? Is it similar to like an LLC investment? Yeah, you're going to get a modified operating statement, uh, which will give you the depreciation, the income, because as, just as you leave the, the assets that you're investing in, you've got a depreciation schedule, you're going to roll that basis into the DST. So when I said a 5% return, that's a net return. Your tax equivalent yield is going to be probably closer to 7 to 7.5% 7 because you're going to apply on your Schedule E and your tax return the depreciation to offset some of the liability that you have from the tax on the order of income. So at the end of the year, each sponsor gives a different kind of a report, but you'll get a full report <clears throat> for tax purposes for your income, the expenses, depreciation recapture, so that you, you can file your returns that way. Oh, okay, so yeah. but they don't get a K-1 like an LLC would, but they get that? You, that get, you get a modified uh, it's, you know, report, a, a report they, that, that the qualifies accountant for will that. know how to do. Oh yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Because you, you know, in some cases, you're going to have income in other states. So you have to, depending upon the amount of income you're getting in those states, you may have to pay taxes on the income are, that you get on that. But it's usually so small that you're below the minimum for that state. But uh, Arthur, you got some questions from the group? Yeah, I've got a couple here. Why don't you ask them over? Um, <laughs> One is not necessarily for them, it's just general questions really quickly. Uh, an owner, how do you get people to pay on time? Incentives. <laughs> where, where's, where's Bob Byers? Where, where's uh, Lonnie? Lonnie, how do, you get, how do you get the tenants to pay on time? Do you find it? Do you find it? Well, so I'm guessing that because of the very low vacancy across the valley here, that you can be very selective in your tenants. So you can pretty easily threaten a tenant for eviction if they're not going to pay because you know you've got somebody lined up to move in. If you're a soft-hearted owner who is afraid who is afraid to enforce the law, then you need a property manager to take over your property to get your rents paid on time. Yes. Okay. 
That's good. Did you hear that? Speaking of raffles, we'll, we'll get those in a second. They're sitting on the table back there. Other questions, Arvel? Uh, one more. Um, with 7% annual rent growth over the last five years and income growth at less than 2% annually, how long can this party continue to grow? Continue. Linda. Linda? I would say forever. How long can we continue on this run of, of so we are, this, we are the highest rent growth in the country right now, right? How long can this continue? 2022. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good? Why not? Um, I, I think it'll continue because we're, we're in the top five in all, all the categories, people moving here, businesses moving here. Um, I don't, all our fundamentals are strong unless it's gonna be like we've all talked about, it's gonna be that thing that is unforeseen that no one expected that's gonna affect us. But I don't see anything, uh, and don't talk about recession or depression, I think it'll be a, a blip or just a flattening. I, I don't ever see us having the crisis that we had in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, you know. I, I, I just don't see it. Marguerite? Yeah. So, Margaret, the, the question is, are the new jobs, is the income level of the folks in the Valley, is it getting high enough to support the increased rents? Right. Is that right? Well, we're bringing in a, a higher pay, uh, you know, we're, we're not just raising the rent, we're bringing in higher pay, And construction. So the, the, Linda's comment for the for the microphone here is that we have a, a great diversity of jobs, and a lot of the jobs are getting higher paid. Um, Chandler, the new Silicon Valley of the Southwest, uh, for an example. Uh, there's a question here that I think we've already answered, but I'll just reinforce it a little bit. How do you test the rent market? I think the concept was that you take one apartment or two apartments of each category that you have, and in, you remodel those, increase the rents, and see what kind of rent you can get out of them. You get one at eleven fifty, and the others are at nine. You know you've got a market that the banks will look at and say, "Hey, this is possible." Um, is there anything else you want to say about that? I've got a comment um, that I heard from a gal that we had in our office last Tuesday, oh, a week ago, that <coughs> surprised me, and it may be something that everybody here can make a lot of money on. She took a little 10-unit property that she owns in downtown Phoenix, nice location. She's got studios ones and two. She took her studios that she was only getting like $1,000 a month for and transient so they would turn over. So for each one of those, she took two of these units and turned them into Airbnbs. She turned them into Airbnbs. She turned them into Airbnbs. She took a gross income from her studio of $1,000 a month times 12 months, $12,000. She was netting gross twenty-five dollars to $30,000 income on each one of those units she turned into an Airbnb. We also had a lender at the meeting that she was talking to and said, would you consider that as income to support a higher value for a better loan? Alex, would you do that? So hesitancy there, but the lender that we had. All right, so if a buyer has experience doing Airbnbs, you might buy into that. Okay, but we're talking about a massive additional income for a property turning in, and it's an apartment complex, not just a house doing this too. This is an apartment building. Ten little apartments downtown Phoenix, and two of them was Airbnbs. You just make a fortune on those two units. This is another question from a previous event. Uh, any concerns on water rights with all the new population growth? No. No. Perfect. Um, water rights. We're talking the availability of water. Is that the, is it, who, who asked the question? It's a great question. So, uh, on a talk about availability of water. Yeah, as the population increases. I mean, I know farms take a lot, but people do too. 
So farms take a lot, but every time you take the populace and, and, and put housing over uh, an agricultural area, you save 70, 80% of the water. So it's great to expand. Um, what's interesting, and hang on, I'll get you a second. Um, we did a, uh, so, uh, so I'm a, uh, an ex-geologist, um, retired 20 years ago. I spent a couple years doing geohydrology, so I know something about water. Not a lot, but, but enough to get, uh, sound smart sometimes. Um, um, SRP, uh, Colette Moore, who's the senior water analyst for SRP, gave a talk at our Sky Song event. That presentation, as well as a lot of the presentations on our, on our, our events, uh, are on our website, the klcg-events.com, so thank you for that segue for that. She talked about the amount of water that SRP has properly managed and available for many years, hundreds of years. So if you're on SRP land, probably not an issue. If you are being serviced via cap water, which may be reduced for lack of rainfall, may be more of a concern, but across the whole valley, because a lot of the water is SRP, the drainage for SRP. The reason Phoenix is here is because the, the Verde and, and the Salt converge and they come through Phoenix. The drainage area that serves goes all the way from Prescott to Flagstaff to Payson to Globe. It's a huge area that drains into this area and they service and control all that. So we have a lot of water, uh, but if you're in just CAP like a Harkwip Hollow Valley, maybe you're gonna be restricted. But just depending on where you are, but big manufacturing coming, companies coming into town, they're no problem as long as they, they locate to a place which SRP serviced it. Yeah, ben had something here. Yeah, when you uh, you look at the uh, water usage, I was looking into it. Um, there's a graph you can find online if you search the state of Arizona water usage. Um, the water usage is actually the highest in the 70s, and our population has either doubled or tripled since the 70s, and our water usage has actually gone down. Um, when you're looking at it, the state is um, estimated we have over 100 years supply of water easily, like you were saying. I mean, every new development has to show proof of 100 your um, guaranteed water supply. Um, and also, I mean, I, I live out on a well, I live up in New River, and there's more water under this state than people know. I mean, I just drilled and I hit three water sources on the way down. And so that, I mean, there's a lot of the cities around here that are using well water. City Phoenix does have some wells. The, we're, we're out of a drought with all the wet water we've had. I mean, you look at, um, there was a report that showed the entire continental US was actually out of a severe drought and only I think about five or 10% was in a moderate drought. And the rest of the US was actually out of a drought. Then would it make economic sense to bottle some of that water? <laughs> put, your own, put your own brand on there. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, so I, I think we agree there's plenty of water. Um, you don't see it in Arizona because it's underground, a lot of that. Uh, we don't have a lot of rainfall, so who would think we'd have so much water? But it's been raining for millions of years in filling up the aquifers and the, and the, the area below ground that you don't see. So. But great question, it's on a lot of people's mind. Um, we said one more question for Dan. What's the difference in investing in a DST and a tick? The tick, or as it was described when it was uh, brought to the market, a tenant in common structure, uh, was, a, was a precursor to the DST. Uh, tenant in common allowed uh, individuals to co-invest in an asset using their 1031 exchange. So they were a tenant in common ownership, fractional ownership, limited to 35 investors. All 35 investors had, had to guarantee the debt to show they had skin in the game. Um, all 35 members had to agree on major decisions. Um, the developers that brought the ticks to the table were developing all different kinds of assets, uh, multi-tenant office buildings, uh, retail centers, wh whatever, whatever they were developing, they were able to attract a tenant in common structure and it was approved by the IRS. That was great until we hit 2009. 2009 hit and all of a sudden the buildings that these tick owners had began to empty out. Bankruptcies, occupancy issues, the developer typically put a 70, 75% loan on the asset with a commercial mortgage-backed securities type of structure, CMBS. So it didn't take much vacancy to occur to disrupt the cash flow to the point where they couldn't debt service. If you were in that time and you dealt with a special servicer, you know that those were not the nicest people to deal with. So you had 35 members 
the developer would come back and ask for contributions back to the asset for TIs, leasing commissions, and to expenses to keep the building afloat. Everybody looked at him and said, I gave you all my money in my 1031 exchange. I don't have any more money to contribute. So ultimately what happened, many of those, unfortunately, went into foreclosure. A foreclosure is a sale. What does that trigger? The taxes. What was the value of the asset relative to the purchase? I was with a national REIT for six years and I bid on a building in Chicago that a tick put together. It was $385 million. I valued it at 165 million. So there wasn't even enough money to, to even begin to get the people out of those deals. So now, were all ticks that way? No, some ticks were great. They were lower leverage, they were on uh, net lease property, so you didn't have those expenses reoccurring. So the DST came along, and to prevent the people from getting trapped into that kind of a situation, the IRS created seven deadly sins, which, which basically means if you're investing in a DST, the sponsor has to do seven things to make sure they protect the investors from those types of events happening. Number one, no guarantees. Number two, the sponsor makes all the major decisions and, and, and the other five things which I've, I've got in some of my brochures. So the DST came along in 2004 after the ticks to protect those people that are investing uh, from those types of situations that occur. Thank goodness. Yeah. By the way, we, we ran out of Dan's, Dan's folder, so if anyone has one you don't want, please hand it back to me and I'll give it to somebody else. All right, thanks. Or leave, leave a card and I'll, I'll email, one. email one to okay. you. I've got them on a PDF as thanks. well. Um, Scott, thank you for moderating. Dan and Randy, um, great insight. You can tell the experience and, and the insight these guys have. So use them as a resource. Their contact information is on the program. I've sent the, if you don't have a copy of the program or if you want another one, send me uh, an email. I'll send it back to you. Uh, but these guys are great at what they do, and I think you can get appreciation for it. Gentlemen, thank you for being up here on the panel. Appreciate it.